people like y'all and, and organizations like ghosts, you. spirits, demons, reincarnation, past lives, the afterlife, divination, exorcisms, witchcraft, the unseen. He's psychic medium Chris George, and he's Victor the Voice Fireman. We are Second Sight Radio. If you are listening to the show and wish to join us in the chat room, visit paltalk.com. Go to the social issues, select other, and enter the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. Tune in to the Mind Cemetery with your hosts, Chip and Nicole, every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Exclusively on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. We delve into UFOs, abductions, ghosts, aliens, conspiracies, and cryptozoology. And how can you... Hi, I'm Stephanie Benetti, and along with Joe Montaldo, we host News on the Flip Side. Come join us every Saturday night at 7 p.m. Central for our three-hour program. We have opinions on everything, and we're not afraid to share them. False history gets made all day, every day. The truth of the new is never on the news, but you can find it here with News on the Flip Side. Remember, don't be politically correct. Just be correct. Join us. Welcome, everyone, to Global Newsmaker Focus and the taping of the second interview with our guest, Alex Gennadinik, successful entrepreneur, marketer, software engineer, and author. This January 5th, 2015 interview will be rebroadcast this Saturday, January 10th, at the program's regular time at 11 p.m. Eastern. Global Newsmaker Focus with co-hosts Vernell and Patrice airs every Saturday on United Public Radio and UPRN 107.7 FM, New Orleans, Louisiana, and 107.9 FM and 105.3 FM, Henderson, Pass Christian, Mississippi. As mentioned, this is our second interview with our guest, Alex Gennadinik entrepreneur, marketer, software engineer, author, and creator of the Problemio business apps with website at www.problemio.com. The first interview can be found at the show website, globalnewsmakerfocus.com, and also on the United Public Radio and PUPRN network sites and the globalnewsmakerfocus.com Facebook page. In the first interview, Alex provided excellent information for the current and potential entrepreneur regarding business planning, business ideas, marketing, and fundraising. As a brief recap on Alex's details, Alex's several business books available at Amazon.com also have their direct links found at the Problemio.com website. Our guest, Alex, is a creator of the highly successful Problemio business apps, again, at www.problemio.com, among the top mobile apps for those planning to start their business with 300,000-plus downloads across iOS, Android, and Kindle. Now about 500,000-plus individuals have downloaded those apps. Now, the apps created by Alex come as a four-app course covering business ideas, how to write a business plan, marketing, and how to raise money for your business. The course itself, pardon me, is based on the successful experience of 300,000 plus entrepreneurs. Lots of research there. Alex also has personally coached over 1,000 entrepreneurs. The network chat room did receive very positive feedback as to the usefulness of these apps and Alex's website. Websites, plural. 
Alex's business blog can be found at www.glowingstart.com, glowingstart.com, and his YouTube channel on business can be found, can be accessed at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash O-K-U-D-J-A-V-A-V-I-C-H, Okojavavich, I believe. But one can more easily find Alex's YouTube business channel at a direct link at the www.problemio.com website. Alex has created over 50 different online courses to learn about different aspects of planning, starting, and growing your business. That link is www.udemy.com, and I believe uh, that Alex also has a direct link there uh, at his problemio.com to his uh, course uh, website. Alex, and oh, I have to add, the cost for these courses is very reasonable, and all Alex's material seems very relevant, very useful, uh, really a, a true treasure for the, uh, uh, for the current or potential entrepreneur. Alex, welcome back to the program to continue informing us on strategies entrepreneurs can use to be as successful as possible. Welcome again, Alex. Thank you for having me back. I'm very, I'm very excited. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Well, thank you, Alex. Well, I have so appreciated reading your material at the website, listening to your videos. Now, you know, Alex, <laughs> this evening, and Renelle will be joining us. I believe she's probably been delayed at work at the office. Alex, this evening, I would like to discuss some of the effective techniques and strategies for the entrepreneur to build and promote his business. You know, Alex, you can state that, isn't it true, your business has effectively steered hundreds of thousands of individuals to developing successful businesses, and I know that your YouTube channel has 150-plus videos on various topics, regarding starting a business. And you add, now, you add to that very frequently, don't you? Yeah, in fact, I actually, there's a new video on my YouTube channel every day, so the numbers, they just keep growing. It's, I mean, altogether, it's well over a million people that um, have come into contact with my products, my books, my apps, my videos, my courses. Um, and, it's, you know, the numbers, they, they, they certainly run away from you because one day it's like, a certain number, and you know, believe it or not, now I have actually over 600 videos on my YouTube channel. Um, so, and it's just a short time ago, it was, you know, far fewer, just because there's a new one every day, and I put out a lot of, you know, there's a lot of content, a lot of educational materials that are created, and uh, yeah, I, I myself am always kind of catching myself. I'm like, oh, these numbers were yesterday, but today they're like a little bigger. But yeah, certainly all around the world, I mean, over a million people. Um, have been influenced by my products in some way. You know, it's a, that is an excellent resource for the entrepreneur, all of your websites, in fact. And again, an easy way to find Alex's YouTube business channel um, is to just go directly to the Problemio, P-R-O-B-L-E-M-I-O dot com website. There's a direct link there for it as well, and also a direct link to the course page. Now, you know, Alex, you have superb videos at your website and your YouTube business site. One video, uh, one among many that I found uh, very useful, is entitled Step by Step, How to Start a Business from Idea Stage to an Operational Company in One Tutorial. And it does offer very pragmatic, very useful step-by-step -step format. And, you know, my, my uh, first comment here, and, and then I, I, want, cause I want you to do most of the, the um, uh, talking as an older person, sometimes I can go on too much. Um, uh, Alex, you're very excited about the entrepreneur uh, entering the business world. You think that the business entrepreneur can make a very positive impact on his community and world, and at the same time, meet very interesting people and challenges. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, because people when people start a business, typically the business does some good in the world, right? It solves yes. some problem, it automates some service, makes it more efficient, it, it, it entertains someone, it teaches someone. So, I mean, typically businesses exist to do some kind of benefit to someone else. So, I mean, I know businesses sometimes get a bad rap, like you know, evil business, you know, we hate GM and Ford and big company, right? 
they're, they're evil. But, but uh, you know, at root, a business exists to help someone with something. So, of course, you know, I'm very excited about, you know, innovation and sort of seeing how people, how businesses, businesses um, and, pre- and people's creativity can sort of change things for the better. Um, in fact, on my apps, a lot of what I really see actually is a lot of younger people they not only just want to sort of create better things, but they also want to secondarily give back to their communities and, and help some cause, you know, either, you know, maybe it's something local, you know, like with job creation or helping poverty or helping, you know, a lot, like a lot of these really good causes. And I'm actually seeing it in young people, uh, which is a very encouraging, actually. You know, that is a very um, encouraging development, that they're interested not only in their own business development, but also in contributing to the social needs of the community as well as their business needs. And, you know, um, also, you emphasize the importance of the entrepreneur's business idea and that, that and the entrepreneur's business idea always evolving, but the strategy, the strategy to achieve that goal can change. Right. So, there, I mean, this is kind of sort of, uh, I guess part of fundamental theory where, you know, let's say um, you want to do your, your business was created to help, you know, maybe in, improve education, let's say, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's your sort of mantra. That's your mission statement. It probably it doesn't change very often. Um, in fact, when that changes, almost everything in your business changes, right? That, it, that would be called sort of, sort of like a pivot if that changes. So, so the mission statement, st- statement typically doesn't change. Like, okay, you're in business, you're going to help education, you're going to improve it. How you do it, there can be a million different ways, right? You can write better textbooks, you can use new media to bring education to people who ha- don't have access to it. You can sort of, you know, uh, you know, many, many things. Or you can bring, you know, better, you know, one-on-one attention to students, you know. So many different ways um, to accomplish the same thing. So you're right, I mean, the, and I think, Usually, the good entrepreneurs, over time, they evolve their idea in terms of, you know, they try to figure out, you know, is it, what, what is the best way to improve education? Is it to use new media? Is it to write better textbooks? Is it to, put, you know, bring together teachers and students, you know, or other strategies? And so the good entrepreneurs, they look in every nook and cranny, and they try everything, and they experiment with everything, and over time, they figured out, I mean, they become world-class experts at exactly how to um, accomplish their mission, their company's mission statement. Um, but but it's from the hard work of and hustle of just being in the trenches every day and looking into the issue. That's very helpful. Thank you, Alex. And you know, in your video, uh, you emphasize often, well, actually, several of your videos that the potential entrepreneur should focus on a business that engages his or her talents, interests, education, and experience? Well, certainly, because, you know, businesses, they typically have a, you know, when they start, the first three, six, nine, 12 months is kind of an experimental time where no one really knows if that business will succeed, including the entrepreneur. And if the entrepreneur doesn't, no, is is not an expert in that business niche. By expert, I mean exactly like you said, doesn't have an education in it. If, if he doesn't have experience in it, then the first three to six months or nine months, it will be more of a learning experience for them, and and it will be inevitably full of mistakes, which is fine if 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 they have that time. But who has six to nine months to waste? Ideally, people would sort of go into a business where they have expertise in the market, in the type of customer, so that they can go in and start with a bang, you know, like professionally, not am- not in an amateur kind of way where, you know, you're expected to make mistakes. I mean, you want to go in with the, you know, you, you want to go in really going for success. So, and, <coughs> excuse me, and um, if, a, if an entrepreneur maybe has a really good idea but doesn't necessarily have expertise or education in a certain field, it's fine. What they have to do in that case is surround themselves with people who do, either good mentors, good advisors, 
or maybe really good co-founders. But someone on the team definitely needs to have deep, deep expertise and understanding of the market, of the consumer, you know, of how the consumer will interact with the product, all those things and how they play together. Because if that's missing, it will be a painful and expensive learning experience. Well, that's very pragmatic advice. And, you know, Alex, as well, uh, you note uh, the importance of correct business planning. And you know how vital the business plan is that's necessary uh, for that plan to be on paper. You referenced the written business plan. Uh, and I, you note, too, that the business plan is necessary for the entrepreneur to both organize his ideas and also if the business plan is specifically asked for by another party. Right. An investor uh, or a bank, whatever. Exactly. So many people, they come to my products, uh, like my apps or, or my course on how to plan a business, and they they kind of think they need a business plan, yes. but they're not mm-hmm. completely sure why. So it's a little bit of an ironic situation, and um, a lot of a lot of it is sort of educating people about, you know, what the use of this thing is, because the, the most ironic instance is when people contact me and say, if I pay you, will you write me a business plan? And what's the point of that person having a piece of paper with, you know, that I wrote where the knowledge has to come from them? Um, and, the, the, you know, whether people ask for it or not, I think it's really important to have a solid business strategy with which you go into battle with, right? Um, so that's really the business plan. It's really the, the sort of overview of your overall business model, overview of your whole business strategy, and, you know, at least, so at least that, so that you have a concrete strategy. And people get really intimidated and they don't know where to start. So I really like to simplify things if, if I could. So for any business, whatever it is, if it's a grocery store or a mobile app or anything, there are three components, only three, that have to play really well together. And if they do, then you have a good strategy. Um, and the one is that uh, you have to be able to create a competitive product within your niche, that's obvious, right? Because you, you need a quality product. Without it, it's really hard to create a business um, or service. So that's one. The second thing is you have to be able to market and promote it. You have to get clients, right? Because that's also obvious, right? Because if you no clients, no business. So that's simple. And the third thing that really ties it all together is all this has to be done with, within reasonable finances, meaning like, you know, you don't overspend on creating the product, you don't overspend on the marketing, and you ultimately end up making a little bit more money than you spend. And if all that plays together, if you get a good product, you can promote it and get clients, and all that happens for a profit, then you have a business, right? And and everything else in the business plan is just, you know, sort of afterthoughts to this. So, you know, maybe people can, maybe your audience can take that. So if they ever need to write a business plan, so it's not daunting or intimidating. Um, that, that's really the core strategy. The, the the caveat is that all three of these components, the marketing, the product, the finances, they, they have to be um, accurate. So you can't just say, oh, marketing, of course. I'll promote my business on Facebook and, and forget about it. Your marketing plan actually has to be good. So so that's where the emphasis would be the quality of the planning, but you know, but but, but only those main three things. I hope that sort of helps. It was a little bit of a long answer. No, it was a very effective, a very interesting, uh, helpful answer. Now, on the product, you mentioned um, uh, the entrepreneur should perhaps, well, should undertake a type of market validation of the product before really expanding into the market with it. Am I correct there? I think for for innovative and technology products, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes for things like, um, you know, cleaners, you know, you don't need to really validate it because it's, a, it's such a proven and known business that, you know, everything is out there. It's known about it. There's no questions really other than, you know, if you have questions, I mean, there are people who can answer them, right? There's no Whereas If you make like a new app or something, like, if you know, you really don't know if anybody will like it. You really don't know. So for that kind of, for more innovative products, the more innovative and unique your, your product is, the more you have to validate it. And, you know, uh, you also have excellent points um, on the fact that to validate the product, well, that the entrepreneur should follow the customer 
cool portions of the product, get feedback, further evolve the product to meet the um, expectations of the consumer. Yeah, definitely. So this is a theory, you know, I wish I can say, oh, this is my theory. But this is a theory by, you know, Steve Blank and his sort of understudy, Eric Ries. Um, Steve Blank is the very famous Stanford professor who I think before he became a Stanford professor, he sold three or two billion uh, companies for at least a billion dollars or something crazy like that. Um, so, and basically, he started as a sales guy and his only real innovation, and you know, maybe he started in the 80s or 70s, I don't know exactly, he's a little bit older now, but uh, his innovation at that time, and it seems simple now, but then it was an innovation, was that he would literally go outside the building to talk to all the potential customers why they bought it, why they didn't buy it, if, when they're using it, like if they like it, what, what they like it, what they don't like, right? And then they would, he would take that exact feedback and tell his engineering team, hey, these are the features you need to build, go. And then they build the features and he would come right back to the same people, you know, the same clients, and say, hey, what about now? And this cycle would never end. So, <coughs> so that helped him really deeply understand his customer to whom he was selling, which was ideal. And um, that is called a methodology, that's a methodology of his, it's called the consumer customer development methodology. And his understudy, a guy named Eric Ries, both of these guys are really known and very famous in the technology world. Um, and Eric Ries is another brilliant guy. He's younger, but he's already sold like a company for um, many millions of dollars. And he's got this sort of, uh, he, he just sort of pushed this a little further and um, it, it, basically the same concept. Refine your product, give it, to, give it back to your customers, get their feedback, uh, think about their feedback, good or bad or whatever, you know, all feedback is valuable. Think about it, embody, you know, embody it, and then think about how to refine on your next product iteration uh, based on the feedback. And this has been an unbelievable, like in technology now, you almost can't build a successful technology startup without doing this because everyone is doing this. Um, so anything innovative, it's like, a, it's, a, it's like a must and it's like a requirement that you do this process. And this process doesn't end. If you end up building a good pro product, the way you stay ahead of your competitors is not so much by protecting your business idea because it, it's open. Your business idea is open when it's live. There's no way to protect it. The, the only way to really protect it is for um, innovative things is to out-innovate, is to continue to innovate precisely with this strategy of, you know, give it to your customers, get feedback, make, it, make your product even better. Next cycle, show it to your customers, make your product even better, and, and, and this goes on throughout the lifetime of the company. And the more it goes on throughout the lifetime of the company, the, the, the harder you are to compete with because you're consistently out innovating everybody. Of course, this cycle slows down as the company grows, but it's really important never to fully stop it. Boy, that sounds like a very interesting cycle, a very effective cycle, and um, it it's a very, very impressive one. Now, in your business model, Alex, uh, you note know that often the revenue model within the business model uh, can actually, it actually can, there can be one or more revenue models in a business model. Right. So business model is a very, very confused term because sometimes people will say, what's your business model? And no one knows what exactly they meant by that. <laughs> they kind of like get, uh, assume what people mean by that. But, so, a revenue model is very simple. I mean, a re revenue model is, of course, you know, um, any business can have multiple revenue models, right? So, you can have, you know, it, it's basically, uh, you know, are you, are you making money with ads? Are you making money reselling other products? Are you making money selling your own products, right? So, is it, or is it, is it subscription? Things like that. Um, they all have sort of, you know, their pros and cons, and they all work well with different kinds of businesses. Um, like, usually the most coveted one is uh, like a subscription revenue model or subscription-like revenue model. So either 
when people directly subscribe or if like let's say you know men need to shave almost every day or every day and so it's you know is that they, they consistently need to buy the shaving cream and the, the, the razors and all that so it's like they're not subscribed but it's like they're subscribed because they need to buy it all the time so those kind of things where you consistently make money from existing customers those are typically the most coveted and people try to actually sometimes even to the point of shifting their entire business model to, to maximize a certain revenue model, right? Because usually the way it works is even though a business might have many, t- many ways it makes revenue, typically there is one very, like typically, and this is not true for every, all businesses, but typically as a business what you want is to find that one crazy breakthrough revenue stream or revenue model that's going to like, ampl- like outdo everything else by like ten- tenfold or hundredfold, you know, like a really winning one that really fits re- and resonates well with your product and with your customers. And once you identify that, it sometimes takes a while to identify that. Um, then you just structure everything around your business to feed it, to feed people into it, you know. Sometimes it's, it, it, it's actually fascinating in practice um, because it's, it's a little bit of an art because you have to, it's, you know, there's so many things to balance. There's the consumers, there's the product, there, there is how they want to use it, there is how you want them to use it. It's all got to come together. It's, it takes time and it's hard. And uh, it's easy to say in theory, but in practice it can be very hard. And you know, Alex, as well, uh, you have much material on several uh, videos regarding the method for raising money. Uh, for the entrepreneur to raise money, um, whether institutional, through investors, or their own bootstrapping. Great details on that. Yeah, so one of the things I encountered very early on is that almost every entrepreneur at one point or another, and typically at an earlier point rather than a later point, asks or tries to figure out how they can raise money. Of course, more experienced entrepreneurs they understand more the merit of not raising money and to, by and of bootstrapping, but by no means is bootstrapping easy. Bootstrapping is hard. It, it's hard. I mean, bootstrapping is essentially for people who aren't familiar with the term. It's basically the, the method, the the, um, the process of growing your business without raising any money. Right? There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of uncertainty. Instead of the investor's money, you're putting your own time and money on the line. I mean, that's really entrepreneurship. It's hard, and you've got to hustle to get through it. It's not for everyone, um, you know. Um, but people who it's weather through it, you know, they're stronger for it. They almost grow as a person because it's so hard sometimes. Um, but nevertheless, uh, most people don't like most people don't like the idea of bootstrapping. It's sort of like last resort. And so for those people, um, I continuously keep figuring out ways to help them raise money. And so I have a book and a course um, and actually an app. They all sort of have the same information. It's, it's about, all about fundraising. And they all have 10, strateg- 10 strategies for raising money. I think that, that my actual my course has, has a few more, um, my online course on Udemy has a few more uh, fundraising strategies than the book, but they all have the same basics. Um, and it's basically, you know, people can, there's the institutional stuff like loans, grants, investment, and um, donations. And donations are, can be traditional donations like people used to raise with email, you know, uh, not, sorry, not, not email, uh, like mail, mailing, direct mail, actually, mailing physical things um, and asking for donations. Or, a more new, a more new way, which is crowdfunding, uh, way to raise donations. I mean, they're all hard, right? But those are sort of the more traditional ones. And then there are the creative things like putting on event series, is, um, you know, raising money from future customers. Uh, things that you have to be a little bit more. You gotta bring more because if you do, if you can't get the money easily, which most people can't, then then you gotta sort of start uh, digging deeper and deeper into how you can get creative. Um, so I keep on adding like lectures to my online course and to, to the book, um, like sections to the book about how to, you know, when I come across a new way that I see somebody did it successfully, I 
go, I go back and I edit the, the, the book and course and I add more stuff to it. So I just kind of like just accumulating ways to raise money because it's something people consistently never cease to ask about. Because it's, it's so vitally important uh, to the growing business and, uh, it, you know, uh, your, the resources there for the entrepreneur at your websites, again, are excellent. Now, Alex, your Introduction to Marketing Video, that's the, the title of it, Introduction to Marketing Video at the problemio.com, P-R-O-B-L-E-M-I-O.com website was so helpful. I know that you have several marketing videos and other material at your various websites and your YouTube business channel. Now, from that introduction to marketing uh, video, you mentioned four pillars of every marketing campaign, those pillars being cost of your marketing, uh, second one, scale of your marketing to reach the people, three, user targeting, and four, conversion optimization. Cost of marketing, the first one, that's very interesting, that concept of it including time to acquire clients. Do you find out that people really are helped by that concept that they have to figure in the cost of their marketing of their business? Uh, yeah, you know, so these, these four things, they kind of come directly as a result of my own mistakes early on. And it yes. hit me that if I just stopped making those mistakes, things would go really well. So, you know, um, and usually those three out of four, if you get at least three out of four, things typically worked out at least pretty well, right? So, if, you know, so it's cost, scale, targeting, and eventual conversion. So, you know, at least, and, and I kept giving, you know, going over example, over example, over, exa over example of particular marketing campaigns. And, you know, uh, when, they, when I was hitting two out of four, it was a fail. But it was, when I was hitting three out of four, it wasn't that bad, and if I was hitting all four, it was rare, but oh my God, it was great. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and then you, you mentioned the cost of the marketing, right? Because the word marketing typically, you know, it's actually, it means free, right? So advertising is, you know, refers to paid promotion, and marketing is like the free stuff, right? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and... People think, okay, it's free, right? They're going to do like maybe search engine optimization, for example. It's a classic example. People think it's free because they don't have to pay money, right? But at the same time, if you have to wait for your page to rank for one month, three months, six months, and really you don't know when it's going to rank because no one tells you, right? So you, it's, it, there's an uncertainty. And that's the cost of, the cost is the waiting, but also the cost is, the clients that you, you, you didn't get if, you, if you're waiting and the, the clients aren't coming. And so, it, so you have this, these hidden costs, not to mention that if you have to hire staff, that's a cost, you know, so, and, you know, um, and even your time, if you have to put your time, that's also a cost. Um, so th there's almost no such thing as free marketing, right? I mean, it, it, with almost all of it, you're going to put in some time. Sometimes the time is negligible, but... But not for not for almost it's almost never that little time. So uh, there's always a hidden cost in there, and it's hard to figure out because what it is because you don't know what it's going to be, right? If you have if you're trying to rank a page in Google, is it going to be one month or six months? That's a significant difference, right? So it's there's a lot of risk because of the uncertainty. Whereas if you actually pay, sometimes it's cheaper because, you know, you, you pay for the traffic, but then you get it immediately. And you can calculate things better and it be, things can be more manageable. So it, it's very kind of a um, poor situation, you know. Well, that's intriguing information. And, you know, Alex, uh, the second of your four pillars of every marketing campaign is the scale of your marketing to reach the people. I find so interesting your concept of leveraging large platforms, people or organizations with reach, uh, and also uh, coverage by the Wall Street Journal or at least a good publication or blog. Yeah, I mean, this is classic because whenever you're a small business, you know, you get a trickle of traffic maybe from SEO, maybe from social media, but it's a trickle. And probably small business owners can sort of identify with this experience where they keep on refreshing their analytics and 
trying to check their traffic and they're getting a little bit more, a little bit more, right? And it's, it's all a trickle, you know, it's because they're starting. So, uh, hello? Oh, we're here. We're still okay, here. Sorry. Yeah, so it's all like a trickle. And then if you ever get coverage, you know, like, for example, the example I give was when I ran a hiking website and I ran, I ran this really interesting hike and the Sunday paper covered my hiking website. And, oh, my God, you know, I had, like, 20 times the regular traffic because it was a Sunday paper, you know. Um, and it was, like, un it was just an unreal experience because I've, I'm, I was used to seeing these really tiny, mediocre numbers. And then, boom, one day is just, like, 20 times more traffic than usual, right? So it's always important to kind of see what large platform or what what large media channel or anyone can give you promotion or coverage. And if, as long as you make it good for them, like kind of convenient or within their uh, wheelhouse, so to speak, you know, like, for example, when I ran my good hike, the Sunday paper didn't cover me because they're nice people. It covered me because that was like a really interesting thing for them to post in their paper. So by posting my content, my event, my hike, they actually made their paper better, right? So you have to kind of think about these types of strategies because, I mean, it can just give you orders of magnitude more traffic. Right, that fact, that innovative factor, it can be so helpful. And, you know, your third pillar was user targeting, targeting the potential clients interested in your product and the niche of your product or service, the user targeting, and the fourth pillar, conversion optimization. And, again, you noted that process, cost, scale, targeting, conversion. Cost, scale, targeting, conversion. Those are really great points. Yeah, I mean, even now, like, I have, like, this mental check whenever I do some marketing kind of strategy or whenever I try to evaluate, like, oh, should I do this, should I do that? That, that I, I kind of use as my mental check, you know, um, and it, it really works, like, you know. Um, so I really encourage people if they, and they just try it out on things that they're promoting. If they're doing Facebook, you know, they should kind of evaluate their efforts on this, right? See, are they reaching the, pe the right people? Of course, you know, is it, what is the cost? Well, if they're, you know, for Facebook, often people try the free, free marketing, but, you know, are, are they getting the scale? Sometimes no, right? Facebook limits scale for, for free marketing. So, you know, you can really actually try to understand what's happening. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a little, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cough. Um, so, yeah, you can really get to understand what's the, the, the insides of your marketing strategy by sort of evaluating it through and putting it through these four sort of questions. You know, are you reaching the right people who are potential customers? Is it the right cost? Are you getting the right scale of them? And ultimately, will they convert to whatever you're trying to do? And, and, and do you even have something for them valuable to do, right? I mean, that's also sometimes missing, although it, it feels like it shouldn't. Be, be missing. Wonderful answers. Now, you know, Alex, um, your videos also mention the fact that the entrepreneur should expect to spend very long hours uh, developing his business uh, and also that he should have a laser focus on his business. And here we've got a great question uh, from a wonderful, the wonderful co-host with Joe Montaldo of the News on the Flipside radio program, Saturday nights, and Flipside Light, that news program, Wednesday nights. Her name is Stephanie Benetti, and Stephanie Benetti is not only a great radio host, she's also a media technology specialist and has had a, a tremendous career in investment banking, banking, finance, real estate, very gifted gal. Now, my question about, well, or my reference to the fact that entrepreneurs and potential entrepreneurs must stay laser focused, spend long hours, continue to expend that energy. Stephanie wonders, Alex, how can entrepreneurs stay motivated? Oh, right. I love this question because it has a two-part answer. Number one, you know, if you I'm going to, you know, I, I always try to give like a kind of a thoughtful answer, but but I'm going to not give one this time, at least in the first part of this, 
the second part of my answer will be thought, very thoughtful, okay? But in the first part, I got to be hired a little bit because if you're setting a business and you're asking about how to stay motivated, I mean, the hard line answer is that you shouldn't be starting this business. I mean, you should be waking up and going to sleep and in your dreams, you should be dreaming about this business, right? That's like, you should be a little bit kind of a little bit like unbalanced, right? Because uh, a business is, is it's really hard to take it from the beginning to success. It's really hard. And if you don't live and breathe that thing, I mean, what are you doing, right? It, it, may, it may be not the right thing. So um, I, that's what I would suggest. And, you know, I really got that from this professional coach of the soccer team that I follow. And he, when, whenever he was interviewed and when people asked him, so how do you motivate your players? You know, his answer is always like, I never motivate my players. If, 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 if they don't want to be here, goodbye, right? So that, that, that's really it. Like, you should never motivate your players. Like, you should never motivate yourself. You should wake up. You should, it should be intrinsic. You should, you should live it and you should breathe it. That's my first part of the answer. I mean, but th there's another thing. Uh, the rational answer here is that things are not so cut and dry. Because sometimes people have habits and people, have, people are busy and they get discouraged and it's harder and harder sometimes to get back to the business because they have lives, they have friends, they have families, they have other things. It's hard. And what people recommend and what people, what actually not what people recommend, what studies show is that you, you might will yourself to work on your business one day, another day, another day. But that mental effort of literally willing yourself to do it, it's too great to it's too great of a mental energy to consistently keep it wasting and expanding on something that should be intrinsic. So what, what studies show is that what you've got to do is make your make the working of your business, the working on it, make it a habit. Instead of forcing yourself, instead what you do is go through a few days or weeks where you make that working on your business a habit, a part of your day that's a habit, that's natural part of your day. If you, if you, if you succeed at making the work in your business a natural part of your day, you will greatly, greatly increase the chances of your success because you'll be actually working in your business more. It won't be as laborious. It will be normal. Like, what else is there to do? It's, it's your habit, right? It's something that's completely normal and natural for you to do. So, the way you kind of start to form, your, form this habit is with baby steps, you know. Sometimes I like to recommend people create um, to-do lists and at least try to cross one off, one item off a day or try to cross, cross at least one item off a day. And, or sometimes it's a matter of changing your environment because if your current environment has no habit in it for working in your business but has habits of like turning on the TV, talking to family or friends, then those are the habits. So you've got to change up your environment a little bit. Sometimes that really helps to um, build a new habit. And, yeah, so the, the hard line answer is you shouldn't have to motivate yourself. But the more philosophical answer is um, try to change up your situation a little bit and try to make it a habit to work on your business. Well, thank you. Those are help, very helpful responses. Now, you know, Alex, um, Stephanie here has anticipated our next subject, will be, which will be your uh, introduction uh, to, uh, to promoting publicity for your business. Um, and this will probably be part of that subject, but it's a good question. You know how important, and, and your video mentions that a Twitter cow can be very useful. I'm paraphrasing here, of course. But now, Stephanie is wondering, uh, should the entrepreneur buy Twitter followers? Or is that a mistake? Or is it a good idea? And are there common online mistakes? Uh, okay. This is a common controversial topic. Um, I've never bought Twitter followers, but I will say it's not wrong to do that. In fact, there have been some companies that did research into common celebrities like Justin Bieber, um, Lady Gaga, um, there's another one, I forget, I'm not big into pop culture, but uh, it, the other one that I'm thinking of will come back to me in a few seconds. Um, and they, they, ha they all have like something like 30 million followers. And they f these people found that 
sometimes up to half of them were fake accounts, whether they bought them, whether they just appeared out of nowhere, who knows where they came from, but half of those weren't even real people who were following these celebrities, right? And it's one of the things, so it seems silly, right? So you, you'll never benefit from buying um, a Twitter follower by having that person buy your product or become a customer. That's not the kind of benefit you're going to get. But everywhere on the web, whether we think we do or think we don't, we do pseudo research, like reading online reviews, looking for social proof, meaning reviews, recommendations, um, testimonials, right? It's all kind of proof. Like if I have one Twitter follower versus if I have a million, certainly you will take a little bit more of a serious look at a person who has a million Twitter followers or 10,000 Twitter followers than a person who has 100, right? And you don't know those Twitter followers. You don't know who they are. They might be complete, they might be fake accounts, but <coughs> but what you see is the number. And so we all do this fa uh, pseudo research where we kind of take a quick browse at the things we can look at. And on Twitter, of course, the main number one, you know, one of the top few things um, number of followers, right? If the person has a million followers or a thousand or ten thousand followers, then you kind of probably think, you know, you, you don't know them. They might have fake accounts, they might not, but you kind of assume at the beginning that they don't have fake accounts unless everything else looks very fake. So right away, for new people who discover your account, you look a little bit more authoritative and they'll take a little bit more of a deep look at what you're doing. And that's all you want. Because certainly you should be doing something worthwhile, uh, and then people can actually follow you for your own merit. But um, it does, you know, it, it, it might seem a little bit unethical to buy fake Twitter followers, but, you know, is it unethical, perhaps? Does it actually work to get new people uh, more interested and more curious about your product? Yes, it does. So, in fact, there is one place we can buy thousands and thousands of cheap Twitter followers. It's Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. You can buy tens of thousands of Twitter followers um, for $5. Um, I've not done that, but I know people who have. Um, they were worried, like, oh, are people going to call me out on it? They were worried, like, you know, are people going to say I'm a fake, I'm a fraud? None of that really happened. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, right, it, it just makes you look like you have a little bit more social proof, and we constantly look at social proof, reviews, testimonials, number of downloads, number of reviews, number of followers, number of likes, we, we always look at that kind of stuff, whether we admit it or not, um, and that's just a way to sort of make your social proof look better. I'm, I'm like a little bit of a, I give, I'm giving very long-winded answers today. Not at all. They're very, very helpful. Um, that concept of really effectively utilizing social platforms, leveraging those platforms to promote your, to promote your business. Now, Stephanie has two further uh, questions, which will tie right into our marketing video discussion, which is coming up. Um, and Ashley should be part of it. First of all, uh, are there advantages to Facebook advertising? Right, so... So the advertising would be the paid advertising. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The way experts recommend doing this is twofold. Um, the, and even to so the main strategy would be to funnel people to some page of Facebook. So Facebook actually makes it very convoluted. If you click on their advertise link, um, they'll give you like 10 options. Almost none of those options are best of breed options. Like, you can probably get better solutions for whatever they offer elsewhere. What they do offer that's pretty good is you want to funnel people from Facebook to whatever else site. Maybe your site, maybe some sales page, maybe some uh, landing page. So, but certainly, you don't want to buy likes or anything like that. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. But Because um, it does have merit, but not a whole lot, and not in the way that people think. Um, but certainly you want to buy people, um, potential customers perhaps, to go to your website or to some sign-up form or something. 
because what Facebook ads are great at and are unmatched by any other perhaps platform online is the targeting is unreal because they know everything about you, Facebook does. They know your shopping habits. They know if you've bought online before. They know everything. And you'll see just how much they know if you set up an ad. <laughs> They'll, they know if you own a house. They know if you like pets or what you care about. They know your interests. They know your disinterests. Like, it's crazy. They know your, obviously, they know the demographic. They know your age, sex, education, income, things like that. But they also kind of get to know your psychographics, your interests, your passions, and they kind of know your behaviors as well. So they know a crazy amount about you, and so you can target people like nowhere else. If, if you have a product that certain kinds of people like, people that have certain kinds of interests, um, for, that, for that, Facebook ads um, can be very winning. Uh, with one caveat, of course, is that typically you have to experiment quite a bit before you get the right targeting, because sometimes it's tricky. Um, you, know, you always want to get it right for the first time, but you, I rarely get it right for the first time. It's all about experimentation, <coughs> which, is, which is unattractive because you have to pay for that, and you lose a little bit of money in, in the beginning. Um, and the second part of this answer is, People can still buy what's called a boosted post where they reach people. They, they pay to reach more people. And, the, the, you know, so this will get you um, likes. This will get you shares. This will get you actual traffic seeing your post. So you can, you know, if you have a link in there, people will click the link and they'll go to your site and perhaps buy. Um, a lot of people, not a lot, but some people I've, heard, and I haven't done this myself, but I just heard from others, that if you do this enough, you will start to kind of draw authority in Facebook because, of your, you, because your post will have a lot of engagement. And then your, your other posts, like your, free, your marketing, not the ads, but the marketing, the free stuff you do, you will be able to reach a little bit more people. Um, and now, I haven't tested whether that's really uh, true. And Facebook always changes their algorithm a little bit, so I'm a little weary of that because I haven't tested it myself. But um, but that's another strategy. But but probably the number one strategy for Facebook ads is to you know get people to target people really well, really well, and then get them to go to your sales page or something else. Um, that's probably the number one strategy for Facebook ads. Excellent. Now Stephanie also had a final question, and that was. How can one promote their business with Google AdWords? Do you think the Google AdWords system uh, is very effective? Right. So the Google AdWords system is also brilliant because it has one element that Facebook doesn't have. Because when anyone types something into the Google search box, they're effectively telling Google what they want and when they want it. And they want it right now, at the moment when they're searching. So... Even though a person might have interest in some topic, most of the time, they're not in shopping mode. In fact, on Facebook, they aren't in shopping mode. They are like, you know, people come to Facebook to get entertainment, to browse pictures, not to shop, right? So, in Google, on the other hand, even though you can't target people by as many things like Facebook allows you, the magical thing that Google offers is the timing so they're telling you exactly when they want it right now. So if you can provide something that they want right now, guess what? You have a very good potential lead. The problem with Google AdWords is that because, is because they're, they're the most mature such advertising platform, they're also the most competitive. And because they're the most competitive since they operate on you know, uh, bid, bidding system, the more people there are, the more people bidding, and the, dry, the price of the bids for the clicks goes up and up and up. So many niches, sometimes a single click will start to cost more than you might make in profit from, from that sale, right? And, and, of course, you need many people to click on it. So, it, it, while, so, so the problem is that sometimes, even though the targeting might be great, it might cost so much you know, 
that ultimately doesn't make financial sense because you end up losing money. Um, what I would recommend is to make absolutely sure that the landing page to which you're driving people to has a very, very, very high conversion rate. And this is true before you do any paid advertising or even any free advertising because you don't want to waste people, right? Waste traffic. So always, it's, it's easiest, you know, you can always work on getting more traffic and that's hard. Either by doing it free is hard or by doing it in a paid way is hard because it's paid. So those things are hard. What's easy is actually if you can, let's say you sell something like a widget and like 2% of your visitors buy that widget. But what if you rewrote the description and rewrote and put up nicer photos and created a more catchy title and increased the conversion from 2% to 4%? Well, you just doubled your sales, you know, without any increase in traffic, right? So sometimes it's best to just optimize your conversion. And once you feel like your conversion is like at a really good rate, then you start advertising because then you can sort of, uh, you know, it might make financial sense because you don't need to drive as much traffic to make more money. So I, does that help sort of, uh, that's sort Certainly of the way. Certainly does. To... Certainly does. Excellent answer to that question. And all, actually all of these answers have been very, have been superb. Now, Joe, I think I heard, I have a feeling that that's Renell on the line if you want to call her again. I don't know if that's possible now, just to conference her in. And Alice, I, can I beg your indulgence here? I really want to get uh, to your great video entitled 10 Ways to Get Press for Your Business. That's at the problemio.com website, 10 Ways to Get Press for Your Business. Oh, First okay. point, hi, Vernell. Hi, Vernell. Hey, I'm sorry. I, was... I, know you're, I know you're at the business. You were uh, late coming back from your office. Right now we're about to discuss. Ten ways to get press for your, to get press for your business. We have that one that wonderful um, expert, Alex Gnadinik, on the line. Alex for now has joined us now. Hi, hi, Alex. Welcome back. Thank you. you know, it's, it's it's just really it's, it's it's wonderful to interview him, isn't it? For now. Oh yes, we've been boasting your your uh, laurels all over the city. Everybody wants to know who you are. <laughs> so well, you, guys, you, know what, you, you guys are too nice. You guys are, you can't see me, but you're making me blush. <laughs> He'd be a great conference guest too. You know you know that, uh, Renell. Now, Alex, on this um, ten ways to get press for your business, several important points. First, you know that the media mention, the mention of the business in media is a wonderful promotion tool, whether the media references to the news programs, such as radio programs as well, journals or blogs. Yeah, I mean, uh, to get publicity in general, it has so many benefits. You're going to run out of time on the show before I'm done listing the benefits because, um, and, and by the way, I have a full course um, on how to get publicity. It's actually really good. Like, I'm not just saying that because I'm like, it's one of the courses that are my favorite because, um, because all the benefits are achieved by sort of uh, following the steps. And let me tell you what the benefits are. So, number one, um, getting publicity helps you build your brand. Because it's not like you're saying, I'm so great. It's, when, when you get publicity, somebody's actually endorsing you. They're actually saying, yeah, that person is so great, right? And so it's much more credible, and you kind of get your name out there through big publications. And, of course, earlier in the show, we talked about leveraging large platforms. And, of course, publicity gets to you, you know, that, that is leveraging large platforms. So, so it's wonderful like that. You build your brand, people get to know you. The great thing is that a lot of publicity is, you know, online. And what happens online is when somebody, let's say, gives you publicity, they also link to your website. And, of course, everybody understands how important links are for SEO. And, again, the sites that will link to you, they're probably very reputable sites. So it's, it's actually, you're, get, you're going to be getting really good links. You're not going to be getting, like, spammy links or worthless links. You're going to be getting like rare, extremely hard to get links that almost no market, no SEO agency can get you, right? So you, so it's kind of like you're also saving money on a ton of money on, by you know, either hiring SEO com, SEO companies or SEO 
consultants, right? Um, but not to mention that the most probably coveted thing is that you can make direct sales. Because if you can get publicity and if you can get traffic from that publicity to your site or your product pages, then guess what? You can actually make direct sales and actually make money. So it has really like best of all worlds. It has the long-lasting effect of boosting your SEO. It has the short-term effect of, you know, getting you sales and make help, helping, you get, helping you get more money. And then, of course, it has the effect of helping you build, a, you know, your own, your own brand uh, as an individual or as a company. So it's really like getting publicity, if you're able to get it, um, it's, it's, it's magical because it, it gives you so much. And, you know, Alex, that is so helpful. Another point is, Alex, you believe that the business entrepreneur should develop a relationship with journalists, bloggers, and other thought leaders in their particular business niche. Certainly. And you certainly, you don't want to do it like on the day that you need publicity. You don't want to be like, oh, today I'm going to start making friends with people. I think, you know, you should sort of be making friends with people in your business niche throughout the lifetime of your company. You know, following the, the journalists, the journalists that, that talk about your niche, um, following the publications, and using social media to interact with it because everyone is like really not far away, right, with social media. It's not like they're locked in some crystal palace far away as though it was like 1990, right? With the web, we're all sort of like one click away and all the journalists, all the investors, they're on social media. They're, they have blog posts. They have, you know, if they're investors, if they're journalists, they publish multiple articles a day, probably you can comment on them. You can email them with, you know, insights, or your, your, you know, your thought out responses. And doing that kind of stuff actually, you know, gets you on their radar, right? You're not going to become their friend right away um, unless, unless you're extremely good at networking. And some people I know, they take it to a different level. They, they go to conferences, they, they kind of, you know, they really seek these people out, um, and they, they kind of befriend them. But if you're a regular person, I mean, at least get on their radar so that they recognize you at least. And the best thing, the best thing you can do, and, and this segue is really well to another benefit of publicity that I forgot to mention. One thing you can do that's really smart for publicity is not to just focus on getting publicity from others because that's hard and it's rare. What you can do is build your own media channel because guess what? You know, with, current, with, with modern media, there is no gatekeepers, right? If you want to have a YouTube podcast, you can. If you, have a, if you want to have a YouTube channel, you can. And it's up to you and your effort how, much, how, much, how many people you're going to reach. So as you grow your own media channels, you start to become publicity to others because you can funnel people to them. And when you do that, you can start to build far more meaningful relationships in business. For example, if somebody's working on something, like some journalist, you can actually have them as a guest and promote them on your channel or on your podcast. And that's going to be a, a one-hour conversation that you would not otherwise have had with them. And, of course, they'll build much more rapport with you, not to mention you just did them a favor by having them on your show. So sometimes uh, building your own media channel and building, building yourself up as a publicity channel as well um, can have such really, really far-reaching benefits as, like, you know, you can actually get covered by other media channels far easier if you give other people publicity. You see how that works? It's, it's actually... Yes, that exchange there of information and also recommendations and expertise. And, you know, uh, you have a very good point, too, as well as the need to reach out to one's connections uh, in the industry. And also, uh, not to forget, uh, you mentioned that one should not forget the importance of face-to-face -face communication with your clients. Boy, there's so many excellent points here. You know, I'd like, I have to mention here um, that the service HARO, H-A-R-O, acronym for Help a Reporter Out, HARO, H-A-R-O, and you describe it as getting press attention by answering requests from journalists for questions in your business or expertise niche. Yeah, I, I personally love HARO. Um, I've gotten 
like when I had a big PR push, um, and gotten mention, mentions directly through Haro from Mashable, which is one of the biggest um, publication in tech and social media. Um, I think CBSNews.com, I think it was that or something like that, and, and a few other very big ones. Um, and it was all by from Haro. And I, I, did, I do have to say that I put a lot of effort into Haro because a lot of people, what happens is Haro, it can get you a lot of exposure. But because of that, a lot of people jump on it. A lot of people sign up and answer the reporter's inquiries. So it, that makes the chance of getting covered smaller. So the people who do get covered are the ones who provide like amazing answers. And keep in mind that most of the time you're going to provide amazing answers, but you're not going to get coverage. Um, it's still far cheaper than hiring a uh, publicity agency or a publicist or anything like that. But it, but it, it's going to take you know effort or you know some people say hustle, right? So it's not like it's going to be a simple way. There's there's no simple shortcut, right? Yes, Haro can get you publicity, but I do have to say that. Uh, you have to put a lot of effort into Haro and providing really good insights to reporters because I've known many people who they try Haro, they answer one or two or three inquiries, they get nowhere with it and they quit. And that's not the way to do it. For Haro, it's, 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 it's kind of, uh, today it's a cutthroat, uh, it's very competitive. So you've got to be really on top of your game. And if you are, uh, you will get really good publicity and really good links for SEO um, and a lot of exposure and actually further far-reaching benefits because you'll also be developing with relationships with some of the journalists. Great points there. And, you know, Alice, as well, you mentioned a, a less competitive option, radioguestlist.com, and that service is where we had the very good fortune to hear about your expertise. Remember, for now, how impressed we were uh, with his web page and other web pages and other information? Yes, yes, and we were uh, immediately checking Amazon and um, pricing all of his books, which are very reasonable. I agree. And, you know, I like your point, too, Alice, that uh, the entrepreneur should try to talk at events to present the business at events. There are many uh, positive developments from that. Oh, yeah, to present at events, of course, um, because it also ties into building the face-to-face -face kind of business relationships, right? Because if you can speak at local events or local meetups or anything like that, or, you know, in theme of other stuff, other suggestions I've been making, not just leveraging other people's events, which is great, but also think about creating your own event series, which is something you can present every week or a month, right, at a regular basis. So, um, but if you can do that, you know, if you can present there, the conversation of the evening will be focused around your business. People will be, people will be coming up to you. They'll know who you are uh, because you've spoken at the event. Um, they'll they'll want to network with you. They'll you know they'll have suggestions for how to collaborate, and you can build many very nice business relationships like that. So events are actually really good. And if you can even, to take it even one step further, if you can build your own successful event series, it will give you a lot of credibility with your business. It will give you a lot of um, great business connections. But what it will also give you is a potential to make money directly from the events, right? Because you can charge for attendance or many other things you can make. There's, another, there's a bunch of ways you can make money from, from events. But uh, so certainly you can even even become a revenue stream. So uh, it can be actually really, you know, I love events. Whenever I coach a business or have my own business, I always think about how to have events or workshops um, because it, it's great on so many, in so many levels. That's a good networking um, way to uh, get people to notice what it is that you really pushing in terms of expertise, knowledge, cost, it really it really works out well. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic for networking. Yes, it is. And, you know, uh, you also reference uh, there that one should, the business um, entrepreneur should really uh, try to be a want and want to be a PR magnet. You've been very successful in through uh, 
innovative ways to promote your business, and one of them even attracted the national NPR, the National Public Radio's attention. Oh, yeah, so that was a fun uh, story. So this is when I had that hiking website. You know, no one wanted to sort of join my hikes, right? I, it was a group hiking website. I thought it was going to be big, but, it, you know, it kind of struggled in the beginning. And I had to figure out how to make it stop struggling. I had to figure out how to get people to come. So what I did was, instead of having, like, regular old hikes that anybody could go on on their own, they didn't need me. You know, I lived in San Francisco at that time, and some, there are many ships, not many people know about this, but there are many ships which crashed, you know, throughout the previous decades. There are many ships which crashed on the rocks of the San Francisco sort of, like, coastline, um, and sunk, and some you can see peeking out of the water during low tide. And so I researched this, and I, I was kind of a geek about it because I, I was myself curious, because it's a very curious sort of thing, because you wouldn't think that in a big city there are, like, shipwrecks. You know, it sounds something like out of a pirate movie. And it made me geeky enough to research this, and then I was like, wow, this is pretty interesting. And I, And so instead of creating regular old hikes, I was like, my hikes were sort of titled something like shipwreck, hunt, hike at low tide, right? And then that's actually how the Sunday paper picked up my uh, website and my events because, I mean, that's the coolest sounding event in that city that day potentially, right? Unless some big band is playing or something, right? It's really unique. No one's expecting that. You know, it's not like the baseball team is playing because they're playing like every day, Right? Obviously, they draw big crowds, but it's it's not that unique and interesting. So the shipwreck thing, I mean, it was like really unique. So one day, I just you know somebody told me like, hey, they're talking about you on NPR, and it wasn't solicited by me, and not even actually most of my my publicity wasn't solicited for that business. It was really that um, people started seeing my headlines, the cool different events, and the shipwreck thing was just one of them. I, I came up with a ton of different ideas. And people, were st- they started to pick it up, and they started to republish it on bigger sites. And it actually really helped me grow that particular business by having such cool events that, like, people had to, like, double take, you know? They're like, wow, what is this? Shipwrecks in San Francisco? So they talked about NTR a little bit. Wow. The key word shipwreck, I'm sure, had a lot to do with it. Yeah, and people were bringing their kids, and people were like, you know, coming from out of town even. And wow. The, I'll tell you the hilarious thing is that the best thing, about, and this is funny to me a little bit, but the best thing about it was the headline. It was an amazing headline. Like, it, it really got the attention of all the publications. So, the, but the problem is that the shipwrecks, they don't look like they look like in the movies. They've been in the water for decades. They look like crap. <laughs> So so when people were coming and seeing these shipwrecks, they were kind of sometimes disappointed because they were expecting, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. And they were getting, like, broken things, you know, like just things sticking out of the water. So sometimes their expectation had been built up by, like, fairy tales in Hollywood. So, um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you know, I had to do what I had to do. I had to, you know, but that was a great headline. Yeah. We know, Alex, thank you so much for this innovative and helpful advice for the entrepreneur and those planning to start a business or those intending to further develop and promote an already existing business. Please consider Alex being a return guest for additional interviews. It would be our honor. And, Vernel, uh, any closing comments to the guest? Well, thank you so very much for coming again, Alex, and you are welcome anytime. Thank you guys. I, I you guys are so flattering. Of course, I of course I would love to come back. Um, and you know, I, you guys are complimenting me left and right. I'm blushing here. Well, you well know, that's Alice? good. You're a hard worker, and you deserve the credit that's due. Thank you. Highly agree, Vernell. Great point. And you know, your information and excellent strategies and techniques for the entrepreneur to grow and develop a business have been a blessing to many. Um, now, um, Alex, could you note your closing comments to our listeners? Sure. So, 
if anyone, by the way, I love hear, hearing from people. So if anybody wants to drop me a note, I'm alex at problemio.com. You can also find all my contact information. Like you can have, say hi to me on Twitter, on Facebook. All that stuff is on uh, problemio.com and then the contact us form. Not a form, just a page. Um, it has all the ways you can contact me. So um, I love hearing from people and, and it's very exciting and I'd love to hear what people thought of the show. So they're very, like everyone's very welcome to reach out. And um, is there a way for me to maybe is, to give a discount or something? Maybe I'll, I'll maybe send you discount links to some of my courses so that people can benefit from it. Um, oh, that would be wonderful. Yes, I think Joe would love that idea as well, Joe the owner of the network. Um, that sounds great. Cool, yeah. I'll give like a really steep uh, discount to your listeners. Um, and, yeah, I, I have hours and hours and hours of course material and um but they also have a lot of free stuff as well so um you know either way i can give the uh, free uh the discount coupons or people can just email email me and uh drop me a line and you know take it from there but certainly um i you know if any if any of your guests are interested in business um i'd love to help them Oh, that's wonderful. I'd urge them to contact you directly at problemio.com. Um, and also I'll mention to Joe, uh, we have our contact at globalnewsmakerfocus.com. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, to contact at globalnewsmakerfocus.com. But, of course, um, uh, Alex, your direct contact there at problemio.com probably will be the best way, your, your, your email address there. What do you think? Yeah, the email will be the best, um, alex at problemio.com. And, by the way, I forgot – Definitely forgot something very important. I, I want to sincerely say thank you to you for having me on um, and, you know, for, like, take, taking a look at all my resources and, and generally just being so positive about my work and so complimentary. And I really appreciate being here and, you know, kind of having the opportunity to, to talk to your audience and, you know, uh, just being a guest. So thank you, and I'll definitely take you up on uh, if you want to have me back. It would be our pleasure and our honor. And, uh, you know, thank you again so much, Alex. Uh, good night now to Alex and Renell, and thank you to our listeners for joining us this evening. The program website can be found at globalnewsmakerfocus.com, and this program will rebroadcast this Saturday, January 10th at 11 p.m. Eastern. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.